it is my pleasure to introduce Gabi Hegel as our first um, speaker. Um, Gabi is professor for climate system sciences at the University of Edinburgh and is a climate scientist um, who focuses on um, identifying the drivers and mechanisms of observed climate change. Um, she has a very long and impressive list of achievements throughout her career. Um, uh, and just to mention a few examples that are relevant in the context of this webinar series is that she has been and pioneering the optimal fingerprinting approach for climate change detection attribution. Um, uh, and this approach, I think, is by many considered as something like a gold standard for this type of research. Um, Gabi has also been um, uh, the coordinating lead author of the chapter on understanding and attributing climate change of the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. So with this, um, that's all I have to say. And I think, Gabi, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Good um, afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, which is always the first adventure <laughs> that may or may not work. Is this working? Come on, share. Is, is this working? Yes, it's working. Brilliant. So um, I'm going to talk about um, detection and attribution. Um, I have um, been working um, pretty much almost exclusively in the working group um, one sphere, but I've been really interested in, um, in understanding what, um, how you can attribute impacts. And I um, have a, had a few little projects um, looking at impacts of climate change and how we could um, work with those. So in the moment, I'm on a project that looks at the, um, what they call the safe operating space for the dry tropics. So how um, um, that looks at, at, at tree, tree evolution in, um, across continents. And I've, a long time ago, I was also on a project looking at um, the um, past and future of the Proteas ecosystem in South Africa. So I've, I've, had, I've had a little bit of an understanding of um, a working group two type work um, is, but it is um, much more diverse and quite tricky. And um, some of the methods that we have proposed also in collaboration sometimes with working group two have been flagged as not always working or um, that, um, that there are challenges um, when we try to apply them to impact. So it will be really good to have a discussion about this. And also you, um, you're welcome to um, challenge me on things that, um, that seem like a good idea, but are not. <laughs> um, so I've, I've just posted this um, in, in um, 2010, um, the IPCC um, decided that after the 2007 report, um, where there was quite a bit of a divergence of what different of what working group one and two were doing. And they also had, I think, a little bit of a challenge in talking to each other, that it would be a good idea to um, bring together um, methods, um, um, method discussions on how, what do, does it take to determine that an observed change is due to um, greenhouse gases or um, due to um, climate in, 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 in the case of ecosystems. And so there was a really interesting um, discussion. Um, there was a workshop in 2009 or so that involved um, Schneider. And it, so it was a, it, it was a really interesting um, and challenging um, um, discussions. And out of that came this guidance document in, um, that was published in, by PCC in 2010 um, that is in part still used, but there are challenges with aspects of it. And it's been... Um, a really exciting development that in the um, upcoming report, so in the in the, the working group one has a box on attribution that is um, hoped to be shared across working groups. So hopefully that box is in a, um, almost the same or the same box is also in the working group two and is 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 um, used for them as well, which has been um, spearheaded by Pandora Hope in. Um, so, um, so this basically is an attempt to, to um, define detection attribution as something that works across working groups, recognizing that it may not be. Um, and so with detection we, um, for climate physics, it's quite uh, simple. You, you say basically, uh, we look at a clim an observed change and demonstrate that this change is not due to um, internal variability within the climate system. So weather variability and the follow on from it, but um, that it is, um, driven by external influences on the climate. And um, 
And so that is relatively straightforward in the case of, of climate. Um, although the observations of variability of climate are, of course, sh um, shaded by the, um, by the already occurring change. In the case of e ecosystems or, or impacts, it can be even more tricky because you have, um, for example, for agricultural production, you have a background of of a, a quite dramatic change um, that, um, that you're not interested in. So, um, so that would be detection. So is this change unusual? Um, and then attribution is what has this change been due to? So it's the process of carefully looking at the different um, possible explanations. And um, an important part of it is to really um, have a good hard look at what could have caused this change and look um, at multiple possible explanations um, in um, simultaneously, so not um, not only check if the change is consistent with one particular explanation, but also if other explanations um, could explain this change as well. So that's that old guidance document. And if you try to attribute a change um, in, um, in in physical climate to causes, um, the first step is to frame the question. And I'm sure Freddy will um, talk um, a lot about framing a question next week or um, at the next seminar um, when it um, comes to um, event attribution. So we would want to look at what climate variable does uh, um, is um, describes a change, what's the time scale in which we are considering that change, how widespread is it? And, um, and, the, and another important part is what are the properties and uncertainties of the observations we are using to characterize it? Um, and then what may have influenced climate change in these contexts. Um, and this leads to what we might call the fingerprint of climate change. So what is, the, what is it that we are looking for in data? And in the, um, in the paper by Hasselman 1979 that has been referred to in the Nobel Prize, which was quite an exciting event, um, is um, this is what's called the fingerprint of climate change. So in, in, instead of looking at a multi-dimensional all time scale climate system change, we are looking at um, a change in a particular way at a, on a particular time scale with a particular pattern. And so the first step is to look at the pattern of the observations and at the pattern of um, climate change um, that we are looking for. And so for the observations, for example, a lot um, of the um, early part of this talk will be focusing on temperature change. And so um, we have um, these long term measurements of temperatures that are based on on, on, on ships and um, and weather stations on, on the um, overland. And the weather stations have problems if they are before 1850 or so, because they might overheat in the summer if they're not shielded. The ships are um, have used different methods to um, measure sea surface temperature. So this is like, there's a picture of three different ways this has been done in the past. And they, they have different little biases that have to be looked at and corrected. Um, and recently we have also, um, since the 1970s, we have satellite data, which are really powerful because they are very widespread. They cover everything, but they have their own biases because they're not direct measurements, but retrievals. So when we look at, at a temperature, for example, I will show one result from, uh, from um, upper um, tropospheric temperature, which um, the satellite doesn't measure the temperature at a particular layer of the atmosphere, but um, an integral of the temperature over a particular range. So it measures um, measures the brightness and that is influenced by a whole lot of, um, but not by just one point in one layer in the atmosphere, but by the atmospheric atmosphere as a whole. So if you want to compare models and data, you have to look at what is actually the satellite measuring. Um, if you look at um, rainfall data, we have um, later in the talk, I have a few, I have an example from rainfall changes. The satellite um, is trying to distinguish um, rainfall um, from above and um, struggles. Um, and the old, earlier satellite data, for example, struggle distinguishing rain um, from ice. Um, and it's a quite indirect retrieval. So you have to look at carefully what do my observations actually see. Um, and then um, at the bottom, there's a, a few plots of that. The observed trends are have interesting features, but we're going to go back to that in the next um, slide. So if you've decided to do temperature, and um, this, the first part of my talk talks about long-term temperature trend detection, because that is, the, um, that is one of the most fundamental things the community has done. Um, then you can see um, at this plot from Hutcrude, for example, that the observed surface temperature trend 
has um, is not a homogeneous uniform trend over the instrumental period, but has um, two kind of quietish phases with not so much trend um, in the um, um, 19th century and also in the middle of the 20th century and two periods of fairly strong trend um, in the early 20th century and in the um, recent period. And what you also can see on this slide is that you have um, also varying coverage. So the very early data cover only um, the Atlantic sector and Europe and Eastern North America and, 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 and the shipping route. So it's quite fun. I just um, used the, this a, a similar question for the students in our in a, one of our assessments where they had to guess what, what, why are there these strange patterns and um, identify the shipping routes. So it's quite fun to see what, um, what is covered. It's also a challenge uh, when you want to um, compare to the models. So you have to, um, so the observations are the gold standard and you want to get your model as close to your observations as possible. So um, to compare them like with like and to compare the fingerprint that you are looking for with what you see in data. So what you will have to do with the, um, with the models is um, in the case of temperature data that look like this, you have to kick out everything that is not covered in the model so that you have a very similar noise distribution. So because if you if you compared um, the average uh, over all, um, all, all the globe um, from a model that covers all the data and, and from observations that cover only parts of it, you and the observations would be um, more noisy and would have higher variability and you might misinterpret what you're seeing. So it's quite important to think very carefully at what you are observing. Um, or alternatively, when you have your um, satellite data, you have to use the same integral over the vertical atmosphere as you see in the data. So, so you have we have this data, and you see a very consistent upward trend. So it's um it's in degrees per decade. You can see that in the recent period we have really strong trends over um over land. We have also quite consistent um, the positive trend over ocean. Or, um, if you do the 100 year or the entire period trend is positive everywhere except possibly in this little gap in the North Atlantic. Um, but over shorter periods, you have a bit more variability. And then the next step when you frame your question um, of what has caused my observed um, changes is to look at carefully at what could have influenced them. This can be quite um, quite challenging. I think I could argue it's a bit simpler for physical climate science, although when you go for local or regional changes, then it can get also quite complex. So on the right hand side, this is from an old um, from a 2018 paper looking at the change over the entire instrumental record, you see um, what um, what we think are the major um, external drivers of change. So the, the CO2 increase um, in, in PPM. And on the left hand side shown from the Mauna Lua Observatory, um, you can also see one of the estimates of sunspots variability. I think that's, a, that's in, in total solar irradiance. So they are not compared to scale. And then you have your volcanic eruptions, which are quite strong negative forcings where you have a cooling, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, and the aerosols. So the, um, so the dominant human factors are the greenhouse gas increases and the aerosols. This is a very well used figure from, um, from satellite Moody's um, looking at um, aerosol optical depth in a particular year. Um, so the key feature of the aerosols is that they are not um, um, globally uniform. Um, they, um, they rain out before they um, distribute widely, whereas the greenhouse gases are very mixed. So um, aerosols will have um, an interesting um, spatial dif uh, um, spatial um, imp imprint also on temperatures. They reflect incoming um, uh, sunlight, but also influence clouds. And as, as soon as it comes to influencing clouds, the impact becomes very uncertain because um, it's non-linear. So if you have um, in a very if you have a very pure air and, and and you get a few aerosols into them, they have a bigger impact than already quite polluted air. So it's quite complicated and very uncertain what the spatial pattern is. So we can measure from Modi's um, on, from satellite what the aerosol optical depth is, but what that then does um, to um, radiative forcing, how this influences the um, incoming um, sunlight at the ground and uh, is quite, quite tricky. And then at the bottom, there's also low, low frequency decay variability, which is another thing you want to distinguish. But for the, so the big human imp impacts are a relatively uniformly increasing greenhouse gas imprint and, and the aerosols, which not only have this interesting spatial distribution, but they also have a temporal 
feature. So they peaked um, in um, particularly in Europe and North America in the 1980s and are still increasing in East Asia. So they um, are quite tricky. And then we have the natural forcing. So we also want to distinguish um, in, not only in, from internal variability, for, but from the impact of solar um, forcing and um, vol volcanism. This was quite important for physical climate science because the question has been raised on and off, particularly by more skeptical voices and sometimes also voices with an agenda that what we are seeing is really due to the sun and not due to greenhouse gases. And so it's very important to look at what those fingerprints look like. And that's um, that's the um, that's um, a plot of the total solar irradiance in watts per meter square measured at the ground. There's some arguments of what the actual average solar irradiance is. And it's quite tricky to measure, um, but it has a clear 11 year cycle. In 2010, the sun went into something that was almost a, an, an unprecedented minimum um, in, in the satellite period at least, but it has since come back up again and is doing its 11 year thing. So if you look for the sun, you really are expecting an 11 year cycle, um, not a strong trend since over the satellite period at all, actually no trend, if anything, a downward trend. And then you have your volcanic eruptions, which are super important for, for the last millennium. So they explain a lot of variability um, when a massive volcano erupts. Um, here is um, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo from, um, taken by the space shuttle for, um, from the side. You can see these layers in the stratosphere that reflect incoming sunlight and um, they, make, they, they cool, and if this is a, an old IPCC plot, but I, I really like it because it shows the, the volcanoes that we made in, in, in 2007. So there are the three big volcanoes in the um, historical record, and you can see that not only do the um, models and the climate models that are forced by historical forcing show a little dip in the follow-on and then a, a recovery, but the observations show that as well. The observations show a little bit less of a dip, and that lines up with the um, particular evolution of El Nino. Okay, so, um, the, so if you look at the time space fingerprints, they are dominated by the, um, um, by the greenhouse gases in terms of what we expect. This is a nice figure from the um, recently released SPM where you can see the observed change um, scaled to a one degree warming, but it's the, so it's the observed um, pattern of change. And then the simulated change at one degree warming, you can see this very similar and the pattern is one of um, in enhanced warming in the high latitudes um, in over continents, rather ocean and so on. And it, the, the same pattern just strengthens as you go for stronger warming. So we, we have a pretty good sense of what the greenhouse gas fingerprint is. Um, the key feature, the key worry we have to do is we have to distinguish from climate variability. And so, um, for example, this um, figure of the UK um, in 2000, I think it was 2010, is a, is a, was a very strong feature of climate variability over several um, weeks. Um, that's my fisherman and I will have to ignore him. <laughs> um, and um, that pattern um, showed a uh, con continuous um, so, so this is one of the features of variability and that one that we want to um, distinguish from. Um, low frequency climate variability causes, um, uh, no, low frequency, um, high frequency weather variability causes low frequency climate variability. This is an, another nice um, result that came very early and was driven by Hasselmann. And um, this is um, just a comparison of climate models in power spectral density. So it basically looks at what is the, at a time scale of 10 years to 100 years, what is the variability? And you can see how it increases over time. This is a, a plot that compares actually the observations with the 20th century models. So part of that is the trend, but you will also see that from control runs that you have, an, you have variability on all time scales. Um, in climate and we have to distinguish from that one. And one of the very first um, detection and attribution uh, detection papers, not, there is no attribution here, um, was um, um, from, uh, was by um, involving Suki Manabe and looking at um, just the question, if I run my climate model without any external increases in greenhouse gases, does it um, show a trend? And so that looks at the observed trend. Um, at the time, and it looks at three different climate models. And you can see that they are quite different in terms of their natural variability. They show a little bit of a drift too, which you really don't want, but it happens. And they also have quite different um, levels of variability, but all of them agree that something like what ha has happened in observations has definitely not happened to global mean temperature. Note that this doesn't kick, look carefully at missing values and stuff. 
So you have to be a bit cautious, but the general message is what the observations have done is very unusual. And a message that is still a problem today is that different climate models give you quite different estimates of what the natural climate variability is. So you have to use multiple models and evaluate them with um, paleoclimate da um, data to get a sense of how variable is the climate which seems the range of the climate model seems to be deep, seems to be quite um, well comparable with um, with um, uh, last millennium estimates of climate variability for example but individual ones um, are, are are can be um, a bit off as you can see here and so um one way of attributing climate change to causes that has been used very widely is understood by the community really well is very intuitive is to just say my tool to compare the models and the observations are um, uh, my, my tool to attribute climate change to causes or to compare the model of the observation and the observations and say um, can i reproduce in a climate model the historical observations without without um, key factors so particularly can i reproduce it without greenhouse gases and, and aerosols, without human influences. And that's this, um, this um, old plot looking at the all forced response, uh, so the historical simulations of, the, um, um, of climate, and then the solar and volcanic um, only runs. And you can see that it, um, you, can't, um, re you can reproduce quite a bit of the early 20th century warming with solar and volcanic, but you cannot reproduce the recent warming. And that's been um, uh, that's been um, very intuitive. The problem is that, of course, it doesn't rule out cancelling errors. So, if you're, for example, you could still argue um, that my that maybe the models don't get the response to the sun right, and the response to the sun is much bigger, and and so maybe you can get um, if you um, you could get a different um, um, a, a different response. And there has also been pointed out that a lot of the historical simulations might have um, counseling errors, particularly um, in these earlier IPCC assessments. Um, recently, um, I think there have been some interesting developments that some models don't do a good job on the historical um, period because, for example, they warm more than observed or the aerosols are not quite the same. So this is more obvious this time that um, you can get um, also, um, you, you could uh, conclude that my model doesn't fit the data because the response to greenhouse gases or aerosols isn't quite on target. Um, this has been used um, in, a, in a very popular figure um, that also, this is now from the um, 2013 report, basically looking at your global average land and ocean temperature and decayedly smooth. So it's just a very, very rough line. And then looking at what do my what is the range of my models using only natural forcings? What is it with natural and anthropogenic forcings? And you get the same message. You can only reproduce the observations with um, if the, if you include um, human influences. And and then that has been pushed to all kinds of regions, so um, to continental scales. So this is true for Europe, North America, Asia, Australia, um, even to with limitations to Antarctica, where the separation isn't very good because we don't have measure made, measured data since um, before the um, polar year in the 1950s. And then you can look at it for, from the sea ice point of view, so where you can see that the Arctic sea ice um, decline in observations is just about peaking out from the variability, whereas in Antarctica, um, you don't expect the two to separate yet, and they haven't. And then it also looks at ocean heat content. So it's quite a nice method to look at, um, do my models and my observations um, show a trend that is consistent with what we expect from um, human influences? And to what extent could I have similar trends as observed if I would disregard the human influences? And um, uh, one method that um, has been pioneered particularly by Tom, um, by, by Tom Knudsen at GFDL um, and looked at is um, can we do this at the grid point level? And he's done this for precipitation, for example, here in a recent paper, and also for temperature. For temperature results, quite boring. Um, we're pretty much over most land areas. You can't reproduce the observed warming without greenhouse gases. But um, for precipitation, it's a lot more tricky. Um, this shows the precipitation um, trend in um, the GPCC, which is a blended, um, um, which is a, a land product, and, and, and then in the CM5. Um, in the coupled model data, and you can see that there is some similarities, um, like high latitude increase, 
um, increase over quite a few regions, um, a tendency for decreases in the subtropics and parts of the tropics, and not much measurement in regions where you really might care about. Um, and um, he has then done an, a comparison um, and, and, and scale um, and just um, distinguished into um, regions where neither the models nor the observation think we should detect a trend at this point. Those are all the gray regions, um, regions where the observations um, are wetter and um, consistent with the models, which is the light blue, and regions where the observations are significantly better than the simulated increase, even both agree that it should increase. So you can see quite a few of those, which is, has exercised me quite a bit, thinking that the observations seem to show a stronger increase in um, precipitation than the anticipated at this point. And then observations and um, regions where um, you actually expect a drying and you see a wetting uh, and vice versa. So you can also see some regions where you have a drying um, that is consistent or not. And um, so you can see th there's a bit of a mixed picture and you can also see the problem with these methods for drawing widespread conclusions, because of course um, you are doing a test um, at every grid point where you have data. So you're having lots of tests and you have to think very carefully about how many degrees of freedom do I have? Can I conclude from this that there is an agreement? How many, um, a simple percentage? Um, I mean, if you if they were truly independent points, you would say um, at the 5% level, if more than 5% of the points are um, coming out significant and consistent, that's um, a good thing. But then there's lots of teleconnections. So it's quite tricky to draw global conclusions from this, but it's quite interesting regionally. So this is um, this is one simple method, and then we have, um, of course, the um, the um, multi regression based me fingerprint methods that have been used um, in um, the IPCC and by the community to pin down the human influence on climate a bit more um, more um, tightly, and also to estimate from observations how much of the warming has been due to greenhouse gases. So what I've shown you so far can tell you. Can I explain this with other explanations if my models are correct? And now what we are trying to do is how much warming has been due to human influences and could um, the observations um, show a larger or smaller response? So for example, um, could, could some of the mechanisms postulated by the skeptical community um, that would counteract global warming and would make it tiny or non-existent, could these mechanisms be at play in the observation? So you allow the observed response to be a lot smaller or larger. So that's what we are doing here. This is basically a multi-regression. That's the um, multiple fingerprint method. And um, my various different realizations of that are popping around in the community. So what you do is you take your observations Y and you compose it from your model fingerprints, um, maybe with noise or without, times some scaling factor that um, fits the um, model to the observation. So that's if this if a skeptic was right and the um, and climate change was not a big deal and much, much smaller than the models make it, then your beta would just be quite small um, to fit the observations from the greenhouse gases and to um and to make it a um both a good model for attribution that looks carefully at multiple explanations and also to fit the observations well you want to have all the important factors. So you would want to have greenhouse gases, aerosols, natural forcings, um, and fit them and estimate those betas, which are the, basically the key output. There's a whole lot of these methods around. And optimal fingerprinting means that you have a metric in your um, multi-regression or, uh, or um, um, that accounts for climate variability. So there's often the in inverse noise covariance to basically focus on the aspects of the signal that are most different from variability. So that can help particularly for noisy variables like rainfall. On the other hand, it also um, can fall down if you are, um, because it needs quite a lot of technical details to be right to work well. So you need to have a low dimensional truncation and all kinds of things. And I, I think I would probably lose a lot, of a lot of interest if I would go into that. So it's something that really exercises the enthusiasts, but I'm not going there in great detail. And I was thinking of showing you this ancient example because it is so intuitive, I think. I still like, think it's quite intuitive. And so the, the first implementation was just to basically estimate the magnitude of a greenhouse gas fingerprint that looks like this and something that is uh, the aerosol fingerprint, but orthogonalized to the greenhouse gas. So the aerosol, if you don't do anything with the aerosol um, trend impact, 
it's just the cooling over most places, but a little bit more over the northern hemisphere mid latitude in that particular model. Um, and you just orthogonalize it, you make it, um, you make it um, diff um, as different from this one as possible. So you can plot them up in two dimensions. And then you can look at what your observations are doing. And you can see that they meander around. So this is like a, a range of um, 50 year trends starting with the very first data points. And you can see that they start meandering around and they in the early 20th century warming, they hit in this direction, which is a bit, which is a lot of greenhouse gas and a little bit of aerosol. And then they wiggle around a little bit again and then come out in the most recent period as um, strongly different from um, as again in the greenhouse gas and aerosol period. And then you can just look at your point that you your most recent point and say if the, if it was greenhouse gases and aerosols, it would be in the blue ellipse. My betas, my 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 scaling factor here and there um, would um, be um, in in this general range. If it was greenhouse gases only, it would be in the red ellipse. If it was the sun only, it would be in the orange ellipse, and and you can then this um, and the the ellipse basically capture um, capture the uncertainty due to natural variability in a fully blown approach. It would also capture the uncertainty due to the model. So that was um, that that led us to the conclusion that it's um, um, it's um, greenhouse gases and aerosols, and. Um, I don't know how, if I should go into this. This is quite technical. So we have um, there's lots of different approaches to do this recently in um, using different um, different thing uh, different components of the fingerprint. This looks at a time fingerprint of global mean temperature in northern hemispheric contrast in northern hemisphere minus southern hemisphere in the observations in black and then with greenhouse gases only models in red and aerosol only models in blue. And you can see that the models, individual models, the thin lines are quite dispersed for the aerosols particularly. So you have to look at what individual climate models do. They can do quite different things than seasonal contrast and land ocean contrast didn't work very well. And then you get again, this kind of ellipsis um, where you now you, you ellipsis the, the magnitude of, for example, here, the greenhouse gas versus the um, natural forcing. That one works quite well and you're quite confident. The, Deep blue is where the most where the most likely true value is, um, and if you try try to do greenhouse um, gases versus other um, anthropogenic, you can you can have the same problem that greenhouse gases you could um, greenhouse gases could be um, similar to um, scaling factor one similar to the model, or a little bit higher. Um, aerosols are also um, um, span a quite wide range. So the, so this is quite. This is not quite technical, so I'm going to quite, quite quickly over this. So the interesting thing is um, about this is a single model. And if you have many different models, um, you actually need to do this for individual models, maybe integrated with a Bayesian approach, or think about carefully about how you think about climate model uncertainty. And then, yeah, let's hop over this. And then when you do this, um, and then the IPCC um, also team usually does this from lots of different approaches. and. Um, and they have done this um, again in the recently released IPCC, um, where they have compared the observed warming um, from um, from the most recent period relative to the um, early uh, to the proxy for pre-industrial, which is like one point in a little bit with uncer measured uncertainty. And they have estimated based on approaches like this that the total um, the greenhouse gas influence is, for example, one and a half with a large uncertainty. The total human influence is this. And the other human drivers like aerosols um, could have caused a cooling of about um, up to a half a degree over the same period. Solar and volcanic drivers have very little influence um, over the entire period as um, does internal variability. I, I hope this made some sense. So the way you get to this estimate, so you have, um, you have estimated magnitude of observed warmings from observations, and then you just scale um, the way to get to this is you just scale um, your multimodal mean change with your range of possible magnitudes to arrive at this. And they have compared it in the IPCC report now to the estimates that are based on um, a physical understanding of how much um, this changes the energy budget. And then you can, for that, you can look at individual trace gases and so on. I hope this made some sense. Um, and and so we can um, we can also look at the um, a, a, a quite a different method um, and a different approach is um, has been um, published um, by Ben Santa over time looking um, 
here at the spatial at, at the first EU, the first um, empirical orthogonal function pattern, which is like the dominant pattern of change in um, in um, atmospheric temperature in the upper atmosphere from satellite data, and he has looked at um, the um, how the magnitude of the change in the satellite data compares to estimates of, in, of climate variability um, from all the models. And so he has looked at if he has 10 years of trend length, so starting at the beginning of the satellite data, um, going to 15, 20, and then the most recent period, um, is we have now 40 years of satellite data almost, or um, I think it's not exactly 40 years. And um, if you compare different, uh, you have different satellite products. So the University of Alabama and Huntsville tends to always measure lower trends than the two other approaches. Um, the, um, one of their scientists is also a quite skeptical voice on climate change. There's lots of different processing choices you can make in your satellite data. So there is a significant uncertainty, but all three products are now above the five sigma threshold, which um, Ben Santa pointed out is the detection threshold for the Higgs boson. So we are um, now at a very confident level, which has been also um, reflected by the IPCC, who said that um, a climate, um, that human influences on climate is now, um, uh, is now unequivocal, I think. So, there's a lot of different methods floating around. And if you're into that, there is, uh, you can read a lot of updates of this. Um, so, uh, um, so Aurelien Rieb has, um, has used a different method to, um, for optimizing your fingerprints, reach regression, for example. Um, Rieb and um, Zwiers have published a method that, not, that treats the amplitude on, and, the, um, and the pattern of a change equally, um, saying that while for greenhouse gases, the, the for, for greenhouse gases, we know that um, the, the big parts of the pattern, like the um, land warming more than the ocean, the Arctic amplification of processes, we understand really well. And we really believe those have to happen. Also, the, the linear trend is a very much physically constrained trend caused by the increases in greenhouse gases and the response time of the climate, whereas the magnitude of the response is driven by uncertain feedbacks. Um, um, ISO video feedback, water, particularly cloud feedbacks that are widespread and influence um, the amplitude more. And so, so the traditional method looked at the amplitude and estimated from observations and the, the pattern we know. And the REAPS method says, um, actually, we don't know the pattern or the, the amplitude. We just, we just look at the mo climate models as a family and fit, find the one that fits best. And then there's a whole lot of causality methods coming on, which people are really excited about. Um, which I think are fundamentally not that different, but it's an, an, an interesting way of thinking about the problem. And the key, um, and, and I think the biggest, um, or for me, the most interesting um, development are using more Bayesian approaches. And I know that some people in the input community are also using Bayesian approaches and they are very, um, very elegant because you can really deal with your uncertainty in a much more um, natural way. Um, for example, model uncertainty. And now I'm going to show you one, one more um, idea that is also a big idea um, and that is, I think, quite nice, is to look, um, is to, to try to um, constrain and estimate from observations the response in variables where we have some problems with the models and um, focusing on the mechanisms in which the change occurs. And the very, very first, very simple um, paper on that one is, um, is um, in came out in Nature in 2007 it was a direct follow on from the IPCC 2007 report and a consequence of a um, and and resulted also in a bet with Susan Solomon where we won a bottle of champagne <laughs> a very nice champagne from her when we uh, when we um, bet that volcanism doesn't matter here so um, we had um, so the idea is basically that the this the IPCC has for a long time said that wet gets wetter dry gets drier. Um, there has been a lot of counter push on that, saying that it's actually much more complicated than that um, because um, the wet regions move with time, they, they move in response to climate change, they move with the seasons, um, land processes are really complicated. So you should not sit on a wet, on a, on a wet point in the tropics and say, this is going to get wetter. Um, but um, the, um, the fundamental physics of it is that um, the um, greenhouse gases enhance the transport of moisture from um, the evaporating evaporating regions into the raining regions. So, so the physics of it is well understood and makes sense. Just um, everything moves. 
And so the very first approach was to just look at models um, and observations um, and plot up in observations in black, in the black lines and in the model, multimodal mean trend um, in the this, this, this slots, um, in the um, dashed lines, um, where we expect um, a, um, a wettening, where we expect a drying, and where we are not sure um, um, what to expect and where the models and data disagree. And that's basically this. Um, and we see that the high latitude increased rainfall is happening in observations expected from models. And um, if anything stronger in the observations, also the um, wettest regions in the planet getting wetter. You can see here, for example, a flaw in this method is that South Africa is, uh, is neutral. Um, and Southern Africa is a region where we expect quite consistent drying meanwhile. And, and, and it was um, found in that um, with a detection method, but also with by eye that a lot of the sign of the change on the broad sonar patterns agrees. But then if you look carefully, your models have huge problems and that plots up the um, where the wet regions occur and where the dry regions occur. So we have um, the um, observations and the multimodal mean. Um, the multi, um, and you can, for example, here for the um, JF uh, January, February, March pattern, you can see that the uh, multi model mean has a, has a lot of more um, very wet regions. So a lot more places are in the wettest regions. Um, whereas the observations have a single ITC set, the models do multiples. Uh, you also could look at, for example, at the um, at South, um, South America and see that here in the observations in these months, the rainfall is further north than in the, in the, in the, in the models. So you could, you could have a lot of read, um, problems with where your rain actually falls, which is going to be quite important when you try to figure out what is going to happen in the future. And um, we uh, figured that the first, our first point of, um, of question was, is at least if we disregard the fact that it rains in the wrong places in some, to some extent, I mean, broadly it's okay, but in, in detail it's not. If we considered um, just where the wettest regions are, do they change in the way we expect? And that was this wet dry paper where we basically aggregated the wettest third and the driest third in satellite um, and um, in situ data um, in the black line. In the, here in the, in the wet regions and in the models as well, and compare how they evolve over time um, for the wet on top and then the dry in, on bottom in pink. And you can see that um, the sign of the change is already um, consistent with what we expect for the future, particularly for the wettest um, for the wettest regions. Not so much for the driest. We have a quite a surprisingly strong decrease in the driest. And if we do this kind of little play with our scaling factors, what is the magnitude of the expected change in observations, we can detect both the human influences, so it's significant, it's not zero, it's much larger than zero, it's with anything larger than we expect. And we can also see the natural response, which is interesting, which is the volcano basically. So here in 1991, Mount Vinatubu erupted, and you can see this kind of drying and followed by wetting, and that also influences the trend a bit. Yeah. Um, lastly, I'm gonna go very quickly on that. What do we, why do we do this game? We, it, it does have implications for predictions. You want to have the climate model simulate the greenhouse gas response consistent with observations. Um, you could also use the magnitude of the observed response to um, as a constraint on the future, which has been done by IPCC. So where their future, their future uncertainty ranges from working group one um, tends to include um, a com um, the comparison to the attributed magnitude of the greenhouse gas signal, for example. And that's a very simple um, illustration from a, a paper by um, Kasha um, when she was my postdoc, looking at um, the change in ocean heat content and in temperature um, attributed from observations at the black diamond with little uncertainty ranges around it, and then plotting individual models. And in this period, for example, the red model, the three red dots, are worryingly far away from the observed attributed trends, suggesting that this particular model is quite warm. It was is one of the models with quite high sensitivity. If we go for the more recent period, the discrepancy is not so large. So you can actually use attribution to tickle apart the greenhouse gas response and then compare, compare it to what the model does for the greenhouse gases only in the 20th century. What may be next? So we have, um, I think machine learning is a huge topic right now. It may, um, I think it may overcome a lot of the challenges um, 
that um, go to these technical details that I, I didn't go into, like how do we um, how do we truncate our um, models um, to best to better match observation um, to reflect the key features, but are still able to invert the co noise covariance matrix. Um, what are the key features that we are looking for? You, they, they could help a lot with finding the, the patterns that move, that are not constrained to be orthogonal to each other and things like that. So it has a great potential, but it's also a, a bit um, a, a black box. So, um, so I'm watching with interest. <laughs> I have a little bit of project in that area. Um, it's, I think it could uh, it could be really impo important, but also tricky. Um, the attribution of change of long term change also has in, in, um, implications for impact attribution and for um, for attribution of extreme events. So we um, we would like if we want to attribute an in individual extreme event, we would really like to have a, an understanding of what the long term change in that region is and if it's consistent with what we expect from greenhouse gases. That helps a lot, particularly if your attribution is focused on, on modeling a particular event with and without greenhouse gases. Um, and um, when you and I'm looking forward to the talks on uh, on impact attribution. And what I found really interesting is the two different trains of thought. Once you could try to attribute your change in an impact to greenhouse gases directly or you could attribute it to climate um, as opposed to other drivers. And both of them are important for um, predictions um, for quite obvious reasons. And I think it, I'm quite um, taken with that. If you can understand that a particular impact is um, really a dry, climate driven or not driven by, um, by other changes that have nothing to do with climate, that is very important for um, um, using it to um, as for, for um, constraining your future. Yeah, that was my talk.